wanted to have said that some 160 million Ghana cities has been paid this quarter in addition to some other payments which were made in December and the first quarter. Would you say that the use of ESLA uh, as security have been beneficial to the stabilization of the economy? Mm -hmm. uh, respectfully, Mr. Chairman, I am not in a position to confirm what you say, but if that has happened, um, uh, that is that is good. Are you to Article 174, and I hope that Chairman will indulge you to be able to have access to your laptop at any time to make any reference. Article 174 of the Constitution vests and uh, with your Chairman's indulgence, I quote, no taxation shall be imposed otherwise than by or under the authority of an Act of Parliament. But for my purpose, 172 1742 is important for my follow-up. Where an act enacted in accordance with Clause 7 of this article confers power on any person or authority or waiver or vary a tax imposed by that act, the exercise of the power of waiver or variation in favor of any person or authority shall be subject to the prior approval of Parliament by resolution. In accordance with Clause 1. In accordance with Clause 1. You can add that, Chairman. Are you aware that the Ministry of Finance and probably acting through you as government representative have been writing to companies on tax exemptions that were granted by the Republic? A reversal of that decision is the mandate vested in you or in Parliament? I think to know that the Ministry is doing this. Um, as a member of Parliament, no such mandate is vested in me and therefore, um, uh, be clear, no such mandate is vested in you as a member of parliament or as a deputy minister designate. You have said you happen to be aware the ministry is doing that, but no power vested in you as MP. He read the constitution to you as to where the power lies. So I want you to be clear in the answer as to who doesn't have the power and who has the power whether the power is vested in me, I assume that he was putting that question directly to me. But um, to answer it broadly, uh, I think um, the Ministry of Finance has a responsibility to administer exemptions. Uh, what I know the, minist the Ministry of Finance uh, and Government are doing is that in the budget statement, it was put before Parliament that the exemption regime was going to be uh, improved and, and that there was going to be a policy to ask people entitled, companies and persons entitled to exemption uh, to pay and to get uh, a refund. Uh, I know the implementation of that has started, uh, in my humble opinion, so long as the value of the tax is removed from the beneficiaries, uh, it would constitute a fair administration of the exemption, especially when, as we have been told by the Minister of Finance, uh, this is intended to deal with irregularities in the exemptions regime. Government dealing with irreg irregularities Indeed, I've worked as Minister for Trade, and I have a paper, even in my handing over notes, I gave highlights on what the state needed to do on the tax exemption regime, and in particular, even to the warehousing regime that was operational at the time. But my difficulty, Chairman, is retroactivity. It's against the principle of any legislation in Ghana before your minister, before government, there were tax exemptions legitimately and lawfully granted by the powers conferred on parliament under Article 174. And the uh, colleague members of parliament, bear with me, all of you have been on the floor of parliament, when on several uh, occasions we've had instances where grant of tax exemption, a certain amount is stated, parliament goes through it. Does it lie within the Ministry of Finance to reverse that decision of Parliament without a rescission order? Chairman, 
Uh, sorry, I'll disallow this question because you're asking him to make a legal opinion. It's actually about opinion as to whether the minister is offering, uh, the, uh, uh, implementing the law appropriately. However, I think the important thing is that he recognizes that the powers in the constitution, if the minister is doing something wrong, we will bring him before parliament. But it appears to be that to ask him whether or not is to let him offer an opinion on uh, legal interpretation. You can ask your question in another Chairman, way. Chairman, it's not an opinion. The nominee swore an oath, and in that oath is to uphold the laws of Ghana, the Grunom inclusive, the constitution of Ghana. I'm driving him, if he so pleases, to demonstrate that he is not respecting provisions of the constitution of the law. I know what remedies to ask for. Does he think that that conduct does not infringe on the constitution or the laws of Ghana? Stand it. He has already confirmed that he's aware that the ministry is doing that. And if indeed is the ministry, he is not a lawyer to advise the minister. I want the, <laughs> I want, I want uh, the question to be reframed in ways in which the legal part is not placed on him. But as to whether the acts are appropriate or otherwise, I don't have a problem. But when it comes to the interpretation of, because I actually have a different interpretation from. Uh, I've noted, I've noted that, Chairman. So, Honorable nominee for the Ministry of uh, Finance, Ghana Infrastructure Fund had a dedication of 2.5% VAT and a certain allocation of the annual budget funding amount. I know you've been working since the transition within and outside the corridors of the Ministry of Finance. What is the total accrual to the GIF fund to which the budget seeks to realign? Mr. Chairman, I don't have that information here. Ghana has an external credit facility agreement with the IMF. Government is seeking to review, to renegotiate, depending upon who you are quoting within the uh, government. What advice will you have your minister to improve and provide for additional fiscal space, given that you have a fiscal deficit, commitment and cash basis, 9 to 10% of GDP? Which fiscal space advice do you have for your minister? additional fiscal space. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think uh, in order to create fiscal space, that is to say, in order to free resources that could be used to provide the kind of services that the Ghanaians uh, expect of government, to do that, I think government has to uh, do things to raise revenue whilst at the same time taking a look at government expenditure to see which expenditures uh, could be delayed or which expenditures uh, must stop that way without hurting um, the, the mandate of government. That, that is to say, without, without hurting the, the services that, that government delivers to the, the citizenry. Uh, those are the two things government has to do. And the advice I will give to the minister by way of revenue is to broaden the tax net, but more importantly, uh, to provide more tax incentives to businesses so that the private sector growth would come with it, improved corporate revenue, which uh, has been underperforming for for quite some time now. So by helping the private sector to do well, by granting them reliefs, and, and by supporting the private sector dealing with the energy sector issues, I'm confident that the private sector would contribute more. That way, government will be improving its revenue. On the expenditure side, government has to look at which 
expenditures will have to be discontinued and um, which expenditures have to be rationalized. Uh, this would be the pieces of advice I'll be giving to the Minister for Finance. IMF. The objective, as I understand it and as I was associated with the process, was for purpose of fiscal consolidation. Do you think that Ghana's three-year ECF with the IMF have been anything useful and beneficial to the Ghanaian economy? Mr. Chairman, what I, what I, <clears throat> I think of the IMF program is that as a country, we went into the program because our debts had become unsustainable and therefore the cost of credit to our country was becoming too much. And as the then president said, we were going there for policy credibility so that investors would trust our policies and if they were, they, they were lending to us, they would lend it to us at, at more affordable rates. Um, if the, the parameters are anything to go by, then from the time we engaged in the program to now, many of the indicators have deteriorated. But I think as a country, we can look on that as something to learn from that the presence of the IMF would not necessarily uh, give us the economic development we want. And so, yes, the program, if not for anything at all, has been useful in teaching us the lesson that as a country, we have to do more ourselves and not assume that the presence of development partners in our country would lead to the development we want. Uh, there was a comment made by Vice President Dr. Mahmoud Baumia as to some government commitment, or call it arrears, of 7 billion Ghana cities. It was initially reported by the media as missing. Is it 7 billion as declared in this budget statement or a contrary figure? It is still being audited, but now it is 7 billion. Is it not a case that you committed in this budget that is five billion? Not you can all refer the... to the attached appendices of the budget commitment and obligations for 2017 and 2019. You put zero zero, so you will not report on pipeline projects. But the factual reference, uh, I can refer also to the State of the Nation address and then a paragraph of the Minister of Finance in this budget is instructive that it's five billion and not seven billion. Which one should we go with? It is seven billion. What the budget uh, presents, it's a different category of what we call arrears. There are many arrears in the economy. In fact, the figure, the figure could even be more than seven billion because as uh, the ministry indicated, the, the claims are, being, are still being uh, uh, validated uh, the figure could be more than the, even the seven billion that the vice president uh, mentioned. What has been captured in the budget is your traditional arrears. That if money has to be transferred to say the district assembly common fund, you don't transfer is an arrears. If contractors have completed their um, the work they do, they have not been paid is arrears. Depending on what stage in the commitment we are, you may or may not classify it in the budget as arrears. But there are many areas in the economy, and those that at the time had come to the notice of the ministry, as I got to, to know from the ministry, was what was announced as seven million. What do you find there does not cover the entire, um, the entire figure of areas in the economy? So is it areas or is missing? And are there pipeline projects that, for instance, between October and December, all other ministries that were executing contracts would ordinarily refer to the Ministry of Finance, outstanding payments 
which is described normally in the budget as commitments as pipeline is this seven billion or five billion or whatever figure you come to after a review missing areas or commitment uh, honorable chairman they have never been missing i was um surprised when i had especially um, spokespersons of the previous uh, uh, government uh, make points about some money, uh, the government claiming some monies were missing. What I heard from the vice president and from the Ministry of Finance was that these monies happened outside the public financial management framework. That is to say you have gift mix, you have platforms that proper expenditures to go through where People sit in their, constitu in their districts and sometimes they commit government, central government. Uh, these happen outside gift mix, they happen outside our public finance management frameworks. And, and so when they come to you, you say they are unreported, you didn't know about them, you didn't know they were in the economy. Uh, uh, they were not missing, they were just uh, outstanding obligations that government had to satisfy. Yeah, I'm satisfied that at least now they are not missing. Chairman, the nominee may not have it, but just for purpose of uh, uh, transparency, I'm referring to page 160 and page 161 and page 163 of the budget statement, and in particular Appendix 2A, Summary of Central Government Operations 2016. And then in that paragraph, I'm still disputing your number, other outstanding expenditure claims of government was not seven billion, but you reported five billion zero three five five eight seven two five zero. And then you can go further to the next page. Other outstanding expenditure claims for twenty eighteen, you don't anticipate pipeline, so you have zero zero zero. So should I rely on this five billion as reported here? or your seven billion, or to anticipate a review outcome of a figure? Mr. Chairman, what I can say is that when we say outstanding obligations, the IMF, for instance, I happen to know, has a definition of areas they work with. So that um, if you are engaging with the IMF, the figure for areas, for instance, may be those claims that have been registered on GIFMIS. Uh, but that government has not been able to process and pay off. So you may add those things and, and you come to a different figure. If you want to do a comprehensive cover of all um, liabilities that government should find money and go and pay at some time, not subject to any decision, the figure is much higher. And I'm making the point again, respectfully, Mr. Chairman, that there are many, many areas in the economy and um, I, I happen to hear the minister say that going forward, strategies for dealing with, with the development of, of unbudgeted expenditures and areas on the blind side of central government would, would, would stop. Um, I, I'm encouraged by that, but it is sufficient to say that... Honorable Minister, uh, you can come and sit at a table. And... Yes, as, as briefly as you can. So, Chairman, since this, this, the minister presented this budget on behalf of the president, and he has come to solidarize with his deputy, and I now can confirm that at least the seven billion was not missing, and at least I can confirm that it's not seven billion, by the minister's declaration in this budget, he refers to it as outstanding expenditure claims. Now, you are saying that subject to review, but for 2018, the minister reports 000. Should we not bring closure that is 5 billion? Based on the budget, not my words, thankfully now my mother said that I should never use somebody I can point as, as a witness. I have a witness. <laughs> the minister is here. This is his budget. I'm his witness in page 160 and 163, outstanding government obligation reported 
other outstanding expenditure claims, 5 billion, not 7 billion. So if you go further to paragraph 163, if you are anticipating that the figure will change, the minister should have reported that for the purpose of uh, classification of central government expenditure into 2018, because we are dealing with the budget for 2017. The minister puts the other outstanding expenditure claims, zero, 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 but goes back to the, his own figure again of five billion. What, what should we accept? Doctor, you have a problem contradicting but, but, the vice president. The minister of finance, is it seven billion or five billion? Seven billion or probably more. And if I can quickly make this point, I, I, I think I indicated it, but I'll say that again. If people or state agencies in care expenditures and they bring that to the notice of government, it will be registered. Now, if government is not able to pay, they become arrears. There are times when government would have processed and be ready to pay, but the money would not be there. That would be arrears. If money has to be transferred to the district assembly common fund and it is not done on time, it becomes arrears. There could also be situations where people sit in the districts and in the um, area. Honorable you have seen the scenarios. Did you so, not consider so the, so all that before this figure? was presented in the budget, or is there any figure elsewhere which will be reported elsewhere to make it up to the seven billion? That's what we want to know. This is the, uh, the ones that uh, were registered within the public finance management uh, systems of government, give mix included. What I'm saying is that as we speak, I am advised that there are claims on government by people who have executed various projects. If you put all that together, you're looking at seven billion and more. And those are not in the gift mix for which you can... Those report. are not kept reported in the budget because they have to be audited first and then the figure could be captured in subsequent budgets. So, it's a Kweku quoting motivated uh, 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 chairman, uh, it will be certainly thanks for your indulgence. Now, I take it on authority that I'm to believe your seven billion and not the minister's five billion on the authority of the president. That is for our record. So, Chairman, I'll proceed further. Now, in your answer, reference to earmark and statutory funds, your minister again was kind enough to copiously refer to the Honorable Secretary 2010, 2011, 2015 budget statement when he analyzed difficulties of statutory funds and realignment funds. In just your answer, you have alluded to the fact that government is always in areas, common fund, NHIA. What accounts for it, and how do you intend to deal with it? There may be several factors, but one factor which is so clear is that there are so many rigidities in our public finance management space. That is to say, by law, you are required to pay so-so and so percentage of tax revenue for the purpose of, 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 say, the GET fund. You're supposed to pay this. You're supposed to pay that. The result is that government, central government um, revenue is encumbered before the minister has the minister and government have uh, the opportunity to examine priorities and to direct resources accordingly. Therefore, you would see, as you have just indicated, government, uh, instead of transferring, government knows that there is no money, and therefore we begin to have these arrears years upon years. So, if you ask, what I think is a one of the reasons why we have. Uh, the development of these arrears on statutory funds, it is because over the years, government has just been unable to. The way to deal with it uh, is what I think uh, government is seeking to do, to cap uh, earmark funds and to free resources so that um, 
public expenditure would become a legitimate instrument for responding to changing public priorities? Uh, uh, thank you. I, I wanted to do a follow-up. Um, Honorable Kwat, you're talking about public funds being capped and rigidities. When it comes to NHI, my view is that we deliberately said we are taxing ourselves extra two and a half percent, specifically geared towards dealing with health service funding. So how would that be a, a rigidity to you, such that there should be areas? Um, uh, get fund. We said two and a half percent of uh, uh, the VAT. So if you count the global 17 and a half percent as yours, it is an error in the first place, which will make you think that there's um, um, rigidity. But otherwise, my view is that Ghanaians agreed to pay us, I mean, pay extra tax, put it aside to take care of our health needs. So it should not be considered as your revenue in the first place to talk about rigidity. What do you say to that? You consider that there's a limit to how much taxation you can impose on people and on businesses. So by imposing, for instance, a 2.5 percentage uh, uh, VAT for the purposes of, say, NHIS, you are occupying the space within which you can take money from the citizenry. You are exhausting it because there's a limit. So if it comes to a point where government is unable to impose additional taxes, because the imposition of taxes for the earmarked uh, purposes you just referred to has taken up the tax base, then it becomes a rigidity on government, and government has to deal with it as it stands. And I think that we ought not to think of these things as government. I, I see them as the public contributing resources. Now, if we pay statutory funds, and we pay wages, and we pay... Uh, our debt service obligations, and the money is finished. The money is finished, if you look at our budget. So we must ask, how should central government operate? In the past, the response has been to borrow. We have so borrowed that now the international market is beginning to look at us as credit risky, and therefore we are borrowed at very high risk. I think we are clear in our minds as a people that that part is unsustainable. So that is the rigidity we talk about. And I am pleased that government is now taking steps to create a balance. So as far as I understand the government's uh, responses to the situation, government is not abolishing these statutory funds. Government is saying that we will cap it up to a point so that resources will be free to do the other things that government has to do. Uh, chairman. I would have a difficulty accepting the minister's answer and to use your own words to chairman's question. Two and a half percent VAT dedicated to health insurance. We build a national consensus as a country to do that. Two and a half percent VAT to support education. We build a national consensus to do that. Two and a half percent GIF, an annual budget funding amount. We build a national consensus to do that. What in your answer to the chairman's question, you are saying there is a limit to which you want to tax people. You are not forgiving the Ghanaian people that tax. Otherwise, take off the two and a half percent, and the Ghanaian people know that you are a forgiven government, but you are taking a two and a half percent dedicated for health and education. That's what you are describing as freed resources. It is not freed resources. Anyway, chairman, but I note that he describes that as free resources. We are saying that you are going to undermine the operation and existence of those funds. Will this government borrow? Yes. Um, this government, I think, I, I, I can't speak for government, but if I look at the 2017 budget statement, government will borrow. How much does government seek to borrow in the 2017 financial yeah. I don't have the figure here, Mr. Chairman. I have a figure of 13 billion Ghana cities. Is that the case? 
of your budget statement? I, I, I can confirm that. Will that worsen our debt status or improve it? If I accept that figure, then what it will do would be this, that because after the payment of statutory funds, after the payments of wages, and after the payment of, in, uh, uh, of interest on the monies we have borrowed, nothing is left. That is what has made it necessary for government to, to, to borrow. And if we accept your figure, what that should tell us is that these rigidities have to be dealt with. And again, is the reason I am happy with the bill government has brought to parliament to do this. So if my, I'm assuming that this government will borrow 13 billion Ghana cities to make up for your budget for 2017, you are likely to go for a bond issue uh, of 1 billion. Will that contribute to making Ghana a debt distressed country or not? Um, it would also depend whether or not it would contribute to make Ghana a debt district country will also depend on how much of the loan this government inherited that this government is paying off. As far as I can see, in 2017 alone, interest payment, the payment of interest on the liabilities inherited would be something 14 billion. Amortization, that is to say, it's not just the payment of the interest. You're paying off the debt. It's approaching $6 billion. That is what this government inherited. And um, if you put all that together, it does not surprise me that government is having to borrow. The lesson that poses, the offers to all of us is that government should be careful with these expenditures so that we do not do the kind of borrowing we have seen in recent times.